Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation, Multiple Myeloma, What You Need to Know Before, During, and After Transplant. My name is Susan Stewart and I'm the Executive Director and Founder of Blood and Marrow Transplant Information Network or BMT InfoNet. BMT InfoNet provides information and support services to patients before, during, and after transplant. Be sure to visit us online at www.bmtinfonet.org and let us know how we can help you. This evening's webinar is made possible in part by the generous support of Sanofi, Celgene, and Takeda Oncology. On behalf of everyone listening, I'd like to thank them for helping to make this webinar a possibility. Now it's with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's guest speaker, Dr. David Wiesel. Dr. Wiesel has been a very well-known figure and active in the multiple myeloma community for many years. He is the co-director of the Myeloma Division and director of the Myeloma Research at the John Thurer Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. He is also a professor of medicine at Rutgers University Medical School in New Jersey and Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Wiesel is an inspector for transplant programs for the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapy and serves on their Clinical Standards, Accreditation, and Data Management Committees. He is a member of the International Myeloma Foundation Scientific Advisory Board and is a trustee for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society New York Chapter. He has authored numerous articles and studies on the treatment of patients with multiple myeloma and has presented on the topic both nationally and internationally. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wiesel. Thank you, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to be allowed to speak on a subject that's near and dear to me, which is multiple myeloma. I want to thank you, Sue, personally, the BMT InfoNet organization, as well as the sponsors for the um, making this available to me to hopefully provide educational information to the listeners of this program. It's a very exciting time to be in the myeloma field. Over the last 10 years, we've had seven new drugs approved. We've had one drug approved this past year, and we actually have three potential drugs that may be approved sometime within the next six to 12 months. The improvement in outcomes in myeloma is markable. Uh, it, it's marked. Uh, when I start, first started doing myeloma many years ago, over 20 years ago, survivals were really fairly dismal. But with the advent of newer drugs, with the more common utilization of high-dose therapy, with autologous transplant, we have almost quadrupled the average lifespan of myeloma patients to actually try to achieve a condition of a chronic disease similar in the same fashion as hypertension or diabetes, something that you can just live with over time, but you do need medicines for. And that is actually our hope to manage a disease which everyone, first time they hear about it, it's incurable. That doesn't mean it's not treatable and controllable. And with that as a background, I'd like to give more information to the listeners about multiple myeloma. So what is the disease? Myeloma is a malignancy of plasma cells. We all have plasma cells in our bone marrows. Plasma cells normally are cells that get activated and make antibodies when you are exposed to foreign substances, particularly bacteria. The most common um, textbook course of plasma cell activation is a strep throat. You get infected with a strep throat, Signals go through the immune system that end, eventually end up in the bone marrow saying that you've got a strep infection, and your plasma cells get activated. They make antibodies to the streptococci bacteria, and those antibodies get in the bloodstream, and with other members of the immune system, you gobble up the strep infection. Antibiotics certainly help, and you rid yourself of such a noxious insult. Well, in myeloma the plasma cells make antibodies, but there's no infection, there's no insult, there's no foreign substance. The cells become malignant. We do not know why, which we're going to talk about a little bit later during my presentation. But these cells become malignant. When they're malignant, we call them myeloma cells. And they do make an antibody. It's not functional. 
Interestingly, because they do make an antibody that's non-functional, they don't make normal antibodies. So our whole immune system, the whole array of immune responses regarding making antibodies is compromised in patients with myeloma because you're making an antibody that's non-functional. You're not making enough of the antibodies you need to maintain an active and effective immune response. We can measure these antibodies, which we call immunoglobulins. They're synonymous antibodies or are immunoglobulins. We can measure these immunoglobulins in the blood or the urine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the subsequent slides. This slide just shows a picture with these myeloma cells. And as you can see, they don't all look the same. The deep purplish color is the nucleus. The light bluish color, if you will, is where the antibodies or immunoglobulins are made. And then the darker blue area is other parts of the cell, the cell mechanisms for any cell. As you see there, there's one that looks like a double omelet. Well, some of the myeloma cells act and look uglier than others, and that's an ugly-looking myeloma cell. This slide shows the, nat the natural pathway on the left of what happens when your immune system is stimulated. There's actually two different arms of the immune system. One arm makes antibodies. The other arm works, more importantly, with, making, uh, with taking care of viruses. The virus arm of the, of the immune system is the one that says T lymphocyte. The antibody-producing arm of the immune system is the one that says B lymphocyte. So on the left-hand side, you have a B lymphocyte. You get some kind of stimulation. They become plasma cells. The plasma cells make antibodies to fight off the infection. When we look at the right-hand side of this slide, we see a damaged B lymphocyte. There's something wrong with it. Again, we don't know what the hits are that causes the abnormal development of these B cells. And they do make antibodies, but they're not functional, as we already alluded to earlier. What do these look like in three-dimensional cartoon? And this is pertinent um, regarding some of the tests that we use to measure antibody levels or immunoglobulin levels. But there's a heavy chain and a light chain. So somebody says, well, what kind of myeloma do I have? And the doctor will say, oh, you have IgG kappa. Well, IgG is the heavy chain, as are A, M, D, and E. And the light chains that are labeled in this slide are either kappa or lambda. So you can have an IgG kappa, you can have an IgG lambda, you can have an IgA kappa, you can have an IgA lambda, or you may only make a kappa or a lambda. The malignant cells can do whatever they want. And this just tells you sort of what your eye color is, if you will. And for the most part, over time, your immunoglobulin, whatever type of myeloma you have, does not change. So the most common is an IgG kappa, followed by IgG lambda, and so forth. IgD and IgE are extraordinarily rare forms of myeloma. And when we see elevations of IgM, it's usually associated with a different type of bone marrow disease called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So currently, the number of cases keeps increasing by over 1% a year. There's about 27,000 new cases diagnosed in the U.S. yearly. There's a little bit more than 11,000 deaths, and there's about 80,000 people who actually have myeloma alive in the U.S. The number of cases is increasing, which is evident by the next line, which is the median age is 69 or 70 years of age. Why are the number of cases increasing? Baby boomers, those born between 1947 and 1966, our increased age is all pushing them into the 65 to 70 year, 75 year age range. Big flux of individuals in that particular age uh, category. So the number of cases continues to increase. It's not an epidemic. The number of cases in younger people are staying the same. It's just that our population is shifting to an older age, and this is disease of more mature adults. The male to female ratio is about 55 to 45. If malignancy is not common. If you walk into a general oncologist's office, that individual, he or she, will only see 1% of all the malignancies they see are myeloma. But if you look at all blood cancers, it's 10%, except in African Americans, where it's actually 20%. It's, the disease is twice as commonly seen in African Americans versus Caucasians. What causes myeloma? There's a number of different things listed here. There's this issue of ionizing radiation, radon, 
occupational exposure, benzenes, uh, farmers exposed to chemicals, pesticides, genetic factors, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Is there a, a familial incidence of myeloma? Chronic stimulation, something that continues to stimulate your immune system. Can that cause it? The only entities, exposures that the government recognizes as being a cause and effect are Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam and rescuers that worked in the 9-11 cleanup. Those are the only two entities that the government recognizes that you uh, have an association of myeloma with those particular agents' exposures. But for the most part, we don't know why people develop myeloma. So one of the questions that people come in when they first see me in my office is, why me? Can't answer that. I do not know why them. The second question they ask me, how bad is it? We're going to talk about staging system in a little bit. The third question they ask me, well, what about my family? And this slide represents, in general, what happens with families. There is a very slight, there's a lot of words, a lot of numbers in this slide. Bottom line is there's a very slight increase in the risk of having myeloma in other members of the family if you have myeloma. That risk is very, very small. So if you look at statistics, based on what I showed you on the previous one, myeloma is seen in about 6 out of 100,000 people. That's about the range for the number of cases of myeloma in the U.S. Well, if a family member has it, that number increases from 6 to 9. So we don't screen for it. The risk of another family member is extremely small, and in general, to alleviate a lot of anxiety, I tell patients, no, there's no familial risk. We do not have a gene like they have in breast cancer that we've identified that is inherited in patients with myeloma. There's no specific signal. So we don't screen for it. There's nothing that we would do different because a member of a family has myeloma to look at other members of the family unless there's some true clinical um, suspicion that it needs to be evaluated. Well, this is this bad protein. This is the way it actually looks in real life. And actually, it's this strip that has the black globs and spread out on it, which is actually what the protein electrophoresis. You take a drop of your serum, you put it on like a, a jello or a gel, and you run an electric current through it, and it separates out the protein in your blood. And what we see here on the left-hand side of this slide is a normal protein electrophoresis. The big spike is albumin and most people are very familiar with albumin. And the other spikes are other proteins in your blood. In contrast, the slide on the right shows a big peak comparable to the albumin in what's called the gamma region. And that is where most myeloma proteins migrate. And you can actually measure how much protein is in that, that spike there, that, that uh, Eiffel Tower looking thing. You can actually measure how much protein is in that spike. So over time, when you treat the disease, that spike decreases, 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 hopefully it gets back down to normal, and when we measure the bad protein that's in that spike, we find out it's zero, and then you achieve what we are hopeful is a complete remission. When we want to find out what kind of eye color, remember we talked about the heavy chains and the light chains, we do this test which is called an immunofixation. This is not a quantitative test. The previous one was. The previous one tells you how much. This one just tells you yes or no. And these are oriented in two different ways. The one on the left, if you follow that, there's a blob in the, in the column that says G, and there's another blob in the column with K. This is an IgG kappa myeloma. The other one is oriented in the other direction, and there's a big blob in the one, that, in this particular one they gave the Greek, spelling that's lambda, um, or it would be L on the other one. So this, the, one on the, the patient on the left has an IgG kappa. The patient on the right, they're separate patients, has an, a lambda light chain myeloma. So this test just tells you what type you have. When you're in complete remission, though, when we say you're truly in complete remission, this test is negative that we don't detect any of this protein at all. Well, we already saw a slide that looked like this. This is the bad guys, and as I already alluded to, the one with the double omelet, they look uglier, they act uglier. So how does myeloma develop? Well, this is 
a generalized sequence of what happens. And for the most part, we don't see the three of the boxes on the lower level of the slide, where it says MGUS, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a moment, smoldering myeloma, or we, we don't, or, or not usually do we see what's going on in the patient until they actually have an intramedullary myeloma, which is, means the bone marrow. We now know that there's something that causes the bone marrow to become amiss regarding these plasma cells. We don't know what the signal is. We don't know what the insult is. But we now know that all patients with myeloma actually have a benign process, sort of like a dermatologist who's watching a skin mole on your hand says, well, you know, that's not malignant, but we're just going to watch it. So myeloma has a benign mole type phase, which we call MGUS. MGUS stands for monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which in English means you've got a protein that you shouldn't make and we don't know why. And we know now from very elegant studies looking at stored samples that all patients with myeloma actually have MGUS previously. There's a second hit. That's a very common entity, which we'll see in the next slide. If you take all 50-year-olds in this country, about 3.5% of them have MGUS. If you take all 80-year-olds in the country, close to 10% of them will have MGUS. So something happens. The immune system gets worn out, just like your knees, your back, your hips. The immune system gets worn out. When it gets worn out, it can sometimes make proteins, antibodies that have no function. <clears throat> a small percentage of those patients, because if you think of all the 50-year-olds in this country, if 3.5% of them, only a small fraction of those will ever develop myeloma. The next phase, we don't know what pushes those patients with this benign entity in smoldering myeloma, is that they actually become malignant. And a small percentage of myeloma patients at diagnosis have smoldering myeloma, which means that we can define the fact you have myeloma, but it's not causing them any problems. More to come on this in a moment. The vast majority of patients who have myeloma actually have this form of intramedullary myeloma. They require treatment. But we do know that the myeloma patients go through these stages, but we don't usually pick them up until they actually have active disease. So this is a slide that shows what happens over time. This MGUS, this benign process, just like the mole on your hand the dermatologist is following, some of those moles will become malignant. And that same is true for the MGUS. Some of those patients will develop myeloma. If you look at this curve, what you see at 20 years since diagnosis is there's a number above it that says 21, which means 20% of patients at 20 years will develop myeloma, or 1% a year. So the first year you have MGUS, there's a 1% likelihood you'll develop myeloma. The second year, it's 2%, third year, 3%, and so forth. So it's fairly unusual for an MGUS patient to develop myeloma. In contrast, those patients who actually have myeloma that doesn't cause any problems, this smoldering myeloma, 10 to 15% of those patients will develop myeloma a year, up until about five years. And at five, if you look at down at the, at the x-axis, it says at five, you see it says 51. So at five years, 50% of the patients have developed myeloma. But then the rate of likelihood of developing myeloma actually decreases. So it goes from 10 to 15% for the first five years, and then actually it decreases to 2 to 3%. So for anyone that's listening on the phone right now, if you've had smoldering myeloma for five years, your, the risk of actually developing disease that requires treatment has decreased, not increased with increased time. Well, there are ways to figure out which MGUS patients are going to be in that 20% at 20 years. It's based on what type of myeloma you have. It depends on how much protein, how much of the antibody you have. It depends on those free light chains. And from that, we can actually come up with an algorithm which kind of pr can predict the likelihood of, of these very common MGUS patients develop, ever developing myeloma. And this is actually the definitions and showing some of the functions. The part in the bottom is supposed to represent the bone marrow or, if you will, the garden that the seeds are planted. And the seeds will or may ultimately you know, grow and develop into myeloma. Sometimes the seeds lay dormant and they, they don't move. On the left-hand side of the upper part, 
we see this MGUS, this bit 9 process. It means you've got a protein that's less than 3 grams. When they count the myeloma cells in your marrow, it's less than 10%. You don't have any symptoms. It's a benign process. It doesn't cause any problems. Something causes these cells to change, which is what the different colors are that are represented in this slide, is that over time, these cells may change. And we have smoldering myeloma, which means you have over 3 grams of protein, or you have more than 10% plasma cells. But again, you have no symptoms, which we're going to talk about momentarily. And then there is the patients who actually have myeloma, which have any amount of protein. They have any amount of plasma cells, but they do have symptoms. So one of the questions as we get further along and we talk about treatments in general is, why don't we cure this disease? And that's what's represented on this slide. All these different colors of these different pie charts are there for a purpose. And we call this clonal evolution or clonal tides. And for those of you who would like to get a copy of these slide sets, they're going to be available to you through Sue and the BMT InfoNet. So you don't have to worry about, I'm going too fast. You can always get back and, and look at these at some time at your leisure. So if you start over on the left-hand side, where you've got the oranges uh, pie that has 72%. So what happens in real life is that that's the cell that we can see the best with current technology. So we treat that patient with drugs A and B. In this particular case, it's lenalidomide or revlimid and dexamethasone. And we see that initially we, we see that 72% drop to 64%. We give them more revlimid dexamethasone and that orange's component is now dropped to 21%, and the patient's in remission. The patient's not cured, because what happens? A new cell clone arrives. So we have one that's blue. So we fixed the orange one, and now we have a blue myeloma. We treat that blue myeloma with carfilzomib, or kyprolis, this is the trade name, and look, it goes from 64 to 19%. The orange one's almost gone. The blue one's almost gone, and then this green monster decides to stick up its head, rear its head. We treat that with a different drug, and we make that go away, and then look what happens. The original myeloma cell grows. Eventually, a whole new myeloma can, can evolve. So the myeloma cells in English, very simple, is they change over time. They keep mutating, and every time they mutate, you have to come up with a different weapon to kill it. And unfortunately, it mutates more than we have weapons. Therefore, we are not able to cure the disease. So what are the manifestations of the disease? Well, myeloma itself, these malignant plasma cells, actually don't cause a whole lot of problem just because you have these cells in your bone marrow. But they're, they're signaling to other cells in the body or their proteins that they're making, these immunoglobulins or antibodies, can cause problems. So we'll start with the top. Kidney problems are seen in 20 to 30% of the patients at diagnosis. Why is that? Some of the proteins can block up the kidneys, sort of like blocking up the drains in your, you know, in your sink. If you get too much gunk in your sink, the sink overflows, you can have problems. If you gunk up the kidney, kidney doesn't work. These same proteins can sometimes affect the nerves and give people neuropathy, different than neuropathy from drugs that we give patients to treat their disease. They can have neuropathy before we even give them anything. Immune deficiency. <clears throat> we already alluded to the fact you make a protein or an antibody that doesn't work, you don't make enough of the antibodies that you do need, so you're prone to getting infections. Moving down, we see destruction of bone and anemia. Well, these are not directly related to the myeloma cells. The myeloma cells have a network. Think of, of Sprint. Myeloma cells have a Sprint network. The Sprint network tells the cells that eat bone to eat too much bone. Those cells are called osteoclasts, or they're like Pac-Man cells. If, for people on the teleconference, remember Pac-Man. So the osteoclasts go around and eat bone. It's not from the myeloma cells themselves. It's from a Sprint network where the myeloma cells tell the Pac-Man cells to eat bone. If they eat bone, you get holes in the bones. If you get too much holes in the bones, they can break. If you eat too much bone, your calcium can go up. And if your calcium goes up, you circle back around, you can have problems with your kidneys. So the bone issue is not from the myeloma cells. If you look at the holes in patients that have 
this lytic bone disease in patients with myeloma, there's no myeloma cells there. It's a hole for, eaten away by the Pac-Man cells. What about the anemia? 70% of patients have anemia. The anemia is not because the bone marrow is so full of myeloma cells they can't make red cells. The myeloma uses AT&T, and the AT&T line tells the red cells not to grow. If the red cells don't grow, you become anemic. How do you fix these kind of problems? Well, you have to cut off the AT&T and the Sprint networks, because if you cut off the Sprint, then the Pac-Man cells stop eating bone. If you cut off AT&T, they stop suppressing the red cells, and you don't get any more bone lesions, you don't get any more anemia. So these are the symptoms associated with myeloma, which we already alluded to in the past one. Calcium problems from bones being eaten up by Pac-Man cells. Kidney problems, which are multifactorial, including from high calcium, also from these, the antibodies clogging up the kidneys themselves. Occasional patients will have a cousin disease of myeloma called amyloid, which also can cause kidney problems. Anemia, because the red cells are suppressed. Bone disease, we actually alluded to and infection. So crab or crabby are symptoms of the disease. The workup, I'm not going to go into any depth, except at the bottom, where it says unilateral bone marrow aspirin biopsy, which means one-sided bone marrow aspirin biopsy, is an absolute. It's not pleasant. It's necessary. A, it's necessary to prove the diagnosis, and B, it's necessary because it gives us very important information about the genetics of the myeloma cells. These myeloma, as I alluded to earlier, we talked about one of the, the questions people ask me when they come in, well, how bad is it? Well, that's determined by the staging system as well as the genetics. This staging system was just revised. The paper came out August 3rd, 2015. The original staging system using the international staging system was 10 years ago, just was revised in the August, 13th, uh, August uh, issue of the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And this staging system, it includes beta-2 microglobulin, which is a protein on the surface of myeloma cells. It includes albumin, which is a manifestation of how active the myeloma cells are, how active the Sprint and AT&T and other lines are. And it has to do with the genetics of the myeloma cells. And LDH, which is an enzyme, which is, can be seen in patients with aggressive forms of myeloma. So myeloma is divided into three stages, one, two, and three with obviously the poorer outcome in patients with stage three disease. So the staging system was just modified to include genetic abnormalities, and this slide shows you some of the genetic abnormalities. On the left-hand side is the, what we call a karyotype, and some of you may have done this when you were in biology class in high school, have cut out karyotypes, made sure you had your 23 pairs of chromosomes in the right uh, order, as well as pairing them up correctly. So we can get information about the genetic karyotype of a patient with myeloma, but what's actually much more commonly done is the slide on, uh, is the uh, picture on the left, on the right-hand side, excuse me, which is FISH, sort of like fishing for abnormalities, if you will. FISH stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is essentially painting chromosomes to see if they have abnormalities in them. And FISH can be a very strong predictor of outcome as is shown on this slide. And we actually divide patients into three groups. Standard risk, which is 60 to 70% of patients. Intermediate risk, which is 15 to 20% of patients. And high risk, which is 15 to 20% of patients. And based on the genetic makeup of the myeloma cells, we can put patients into these categories. This is a very, very powerful tool which also helps us predict how patients are going to do long-term. When you look at bone disease, we already alluded to at length about bone disease. So I'm going to show you here, I hopefully you can see my yellow arrow. This is a, a, a head, a, a skull, on looking at it sideways. And these dark spots are truly holes. These do not cause any pain, doesn't have any effect on your brain, but they're holes in the bones which you can appreciate on this slide. The left-hand side is a leg bone. And as you see here, there's a huge hole here. There's a huge hole here. 
only the bone up at the top and close to the knee here is normal. Well, it doesn't take a whole lot of stress, um, bad positioning to have something that's got a hole this big in it to break. So this is the issue with people with bone disease. We already alluded to this. I'm not going to go any further into bone disease except to say that it's in 85% of patients. The way we manage bone disease is by giving medications called bisphosphonates. The ones that are most common to the listeners are either Zometa, Iridia, or a few of you may actually be on Proli or Exgeva, which is a little bit different category, but the, all three of those can help decrease those osteoclasts, the Pac-Man cells from functioning, and actually try to make the cells that generate bone work harder to help fix bone strength. The holes do not get fixed. They stay holes, it's gone. So the, as that is the background, we're gonna to move to treatment. This is a brief history of treatment. The first treatment, the first patient was actually described in 1844 in England. Her name, Sarah Newberry, was treated with rhubarb and orange peels, didn't do a whole lot. In 1845, the second patient was actually described. That patient had phlebotomy. Phlebotomy back then, phlebotomy means bloodletting. Well, the way you used to use bloodletting, which is not news to many of you, is they used leeches. It wasn't until 1947 that urethane was thought to have efficacy. Urethane, we now know, is in floor hardeners and plastics. Ultimately, was found not to have any activity. And it wasn't until actually 1962 that we first started using a drug called melphalan, which was actually derived from mustard gas that was used in World War II. And they found out that mustard gas could actually cause suppression of blood counts. And they found out that not only did it suppress blood counts, but it killed bad cells such as myeloma. Now, also in 1962, we first found the first steroids. Many of you are familiar with dexamethasone, but it was actually prednisone was the first steroid we found to have activity in myeloma. From 1962 up until this study, which was published in 1996, there was a number of different combinations of this melphalan drug with a variety of other drugs trying to come up with a better mousetrap. Didn't work. It wasn't until 1966 when they actually did a comparison of high doses of melphalan, and the high doses required a transplant because it killed bad guys, but it killed good guys in your bone marrow and you found out you can't live without making blood cells or not live very long without making blood cells. But they found out that you could take that melphalan, increase the dose five to tenfold, which would kill bad guys and unfortunately kill the good guys, but if you did a transplant, the bone marrow would grow again, and they found that that was superior. The line on the top for any of the subsequent slides is the, slide, is the group that did better. In this one, it's green, and the group that got the transplant did better than the group that got the regular therapy. So since 1996, transplant or high doses of drugs have been shown to be standard treatment for this disease. Well, have we made headway. Besides transplant, we've come up with a whole list of new drugs, which is going to be on the subsequent slide. Many of you are aware of Revlimid. Many of you are aware of Velcade. Some of you are also aware of thalidomide, Kyprolis. Most recently, um, a drug called Feridac was approved. And we have made major headways over the last 10 years, which is shown in this slide. If you look at 2001 to 2005, if you look here, if you were, the likelihood of being alive at five years, if you were under 65, was 63%. But if you were, under, if you were over 65, it was only a third were going to live five years or more. But then look what happened in the next five-year period from 2006 to 2010. The number of of people alive projected at five years increased from 63 to 73 and those under 65 many of these patients were getting transplants whereas a lot of people over the age 65 were not getting transplants because they were afraid to utilize that therapy in an older potentially more fragile population but look what happens with the new drugs almost doubled the five-year survival in a five-year period i am anxiously awaiting to see what the curves look like from 2000 to 2015, and I'm predicting that those numbers are going to go up at least another 10% each because the therapies continue to improve. So this list here is the drugs that have been approved over a course of time. Already alluded to them. 
the most recent ones, which I forgot to mention, I apologize, is pomalidomide, pomalist, carfilzomib, kyprolis, were approved in the last two to three years. And just in February this year, this drug, panabinostat, was approved for myeloma. I am very optimistic that in within the next year, we're going to have another drug like Velcade, and we're going to have two, not one, but two antibodies that specifically attack myeloma cells. So when you look at different treatments, this is from a group of, of 16 institutions. They get together, um, appoint individuals for all different disease types. So this is what they decided to do in myeloma, but there's a group from the 16 institutions that do gastric cancer. They do, there's a group that does breast cancer. There's a group that does lung cancer. Well, this group kind of presents, gets together, and comes up with guidelines of how to manage a specific cancer. And these guidelines are called the NCCN, which stands for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And when you look at these guidelines, you see a whole lot of words on here, a whole lot of drugs that many of you are familiar with, bortezomib's Velcade, uh, Carfilzomib is Kyprolis, lenalidomide is Revlimid, and so forth. So there are a number of ways, a large number of ways to treat people. And you know what? They all work. They all work quite well. The ones that say Category 1 are those that are considered to be the most efficacious, but even some of the Category 2s and 2Bs are acceptable treatments and effective for the treatment of disease. So individuals listening to this, if you're getting one combination of drugs versus somebody else or someone else you know is getting a different combination, they all probably work very, very well. Each individual is treated as, exactly as it's stated as an individual. One size does not fit all. Some people have more uh, medical issues. Some people have farther to travel. Some people can't afford some of the medications with uh, high copays. They're, each individual with myeloma is treated exactly as an individual. So someone comes in the office and the first thing you have to decide is are they a transplant candidate? Well, Medicare doesn't have an upper age limit for transplant. That's in contrast to what happens in Europe and many socialized medicine countries where there's a cutoff of 65. At 65, you can't have a transplant, you're too old. Medicare does not have an upper age limit. So the limitations are not based on age, but it may be based on their functional status may be based on their heart status, may be based on a variety of other issues rather than just age alone. So you have to decide if someone's a transplant candidate or not a transplant candidate. For the most part, most individuals can be safely um, treated with transplant. The risk of a fatal event, which is extremely rare in patients under the age of 70, is about 1%. And even over age of 70, the risk of actually doing the procedure is in the 3% range. So this is a safe procedure that takes two weeks of your time. We're going to talk more about transplant in a moment. If you are a transplant candidate, you usually get your initial therapy. We just showed you a whole list of different options or different regimens you can get for three to six months or three to six cycles. You have your stem cells collected. You have your transplant. And then there's current interest in giving you consolidation therapy, and then putting you on maintenance therapy, something to keep you in remission for a longer period of time. And some of these issues we're going to discuss in a moment. So what's the rationale for transplant? The rationale is that you give a higher dose of drug, you kill off more bad guys. Unfortunately, as I already mentioned, you have to rescue the individual because we killed off the good guys with it, so we have to rescue them with stem cells. Up until 15 years ago, we used to use bone marrow. Over the last 15 years, essentially everyone uses what we call peripheral blood stem cells. Peripheral blood stem cells are bone marrow-like cells that circulate in your bloodstream. There's a way to increase the number of those cells in your blood. We can collect them on a machine, similar to uh, individuals who donate platelets. And we can put them in a freezer and we can use them. And I know someone's going to ask me, but they're essentially good forever once you've got them properly frozen. Donor transplants, which is the third bullet point here, are still considered investigational. Donor transplants do provide a potential for a cure. And we don't use cure very often, but when you do donor transplants, you have two advantages. One is we don't give back any stem cells that may have myeloma, 
And the second thing is that the donor's immune system can see myeloma and kill it. And that's what's written here. It's called the graft, which is the donor cells, versus myeloma effect. So in theory, you can tr truly cure patients with donor transplants. However, because of this interaction between two immune systems, donor transplants are significantly more toxic. I already mentioned that under 70 years of age, using your own cells is less than 1%. Using a donor transplant, it's 10 to 20% risk. It's still being utilized as part of clinical trials, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So to have a transplant, you need to have certain organ function. You've got to have good, you know, you have to have adequate heart, lung, liver, kidney function, although we can even do transplants even in dialysis. It's a bit more challenging, but it can be done. There's no age limit. And we know, based on the trials I showed you before, that it is better than conventional therapy using old drugs. Some patients may be candidates for two transplants. We can collect cells by a variety of different measures. Um, what's listed here are growth factors. These are cells that, are, these are drugs that stimulate your bone marrow to make more stem cells. So that when you hook up to the machine and they take your blood out to collect the stem cells, you have a higher number of them. Or your doctor may opt to give you chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is like uh, even a better way of priming the well. The chemotherapy is, does generate more juicy or juicier stem cells, but then there's the issue of getting more chemotherapy. Either one can be used, either the shots alone or the chemotherapy plus shots. And again, we almost never use bone marrows except for donor transplants. Well, why should we do this? Well, transplant is the most potent single treatment for the disease. Some of the other regimens, these either you're getting two drugs, three drugs, they are very potent. But the single most potent drug is actually the high-dose melphalan that we use for the transplant. We would like all patients to get a complete remission. What's shown on this slide is what happens if you get a complete remission. If you get a complete remission, which is the top line, you're going to stay in remission for a longer period of time, which I'm going to show you as well on the next slide. So we would like everyone to be in complete remission. Again, the line on the top are those, paste, those individuals who did the best. So if you look at the slide on the upper right, there's a term called stringent CR, which I actually like to refer to as super CR, which means that you, we can't detect anything by any methodology that you have any evidence of myeloma. And you compare that to the blue line, which is the normal complete remission, or if you're at 99%, which is this NCR, which means a near complete remission, and you see a separation of the curves. So the group also on the, the left-hand side, similar thing. This is a complete remission. These are patients who did not get complete remission. And look at down here. If you had a PD, PD stands for progressive disease, your outcomes are really dismal. This is how long you stay in remission on the top, and this is how long you survive on the bottom. So regardless of how long you survive, uh, how long you stay in remission, or if you, uh, your survival is better when you get a deeper response. One versus two, still being looked at. Um, older data says that patients who had a really good response didn't need a second transplant. The studies were not very large. So this has all been redone in a study that was completed in the U.S. Those were both done outside the U.S. This study is going to be available in October 2016. We compared two transplants to one transplant, or one transplant followed by more conventional therapy, Velcade, Revlimid, Dexamethasone. So two versus one, or consolidation with VRD, and all the patients got Revlimid, let alone my maintenance. So we're not, this is 750 patients. Data will not be available for another year, year and a half. So when you look at the different drug regimens listed down here, all these alphabet soup are the different drug regimens. The blue lines are the response rates. And if you look up here, essentially everyone responds to these newer drug regimens. How deep is the response, which is the green, this complete remission, has also improved over time. These are older regimens, this VAD down here, regimens we used up until 2000, 2002, 
And subsequently, RVD, which is the most commonly used regimen, has a response rate of almost 100% and a complete remission rate of nearly 50%. This is before you have a transplant. These regimens are very potent. This is the new um, staging system, just to show, because I this is a transplant-based um, um, webcast. So the group on the left had, did not have a transplant using new drugs. So these are patients who did receive Revlimid or Velcade, some of the newer drugs. The, the group on the right are the group that did get a transplant. If you come down here and you look at the different stages, the one on the left, if you just look at stage one, the average survival is 66 months. The group on the right that did have a transplant, NR means it wasn't reached. So let's look at group two, ISS2, 70 months. If you had a transplant, it was 88 months. So you get significantly longer remission durations if you have a transplant. That being said, this is a trial that was published a year ago to see if there really was a benefit of a transplant versus not having a transplant, not just looking at cumulative data, but actually doing a direct head-to-head -head comparison. So the blue group had a tra two transplants. The red group had, did not have a transplant. Bottom line is, when you look at the group that did not have the transplant, their remission duration was 22 months. If you had a transplant, how long you stayed in remission was 43 months. When you looked at what was the likelihood of being alive at four years, 65% versus 82%. So the transplant group wins. This is a trial that may be presented this fall, this winter, I should say, at our international meetings. Uh, this is a trial comparing early versus late transplant. Very large trial. It's going to be over 1,500 patients. Patients on the left got VRD, Velcade Revdex. They got their stem cells collected, and they had a transplant. They then got consolidation with the VRD, and then they had Revlimid maintenance. This is the early transplant group. The group on the right had the same regimen, except they got five. They got their stem cells collected, but then they got VRD for five more cycles, went on Revlimid maintenance, and when they relapse, they get a transplant. So it's early versus late transplant. Data may be available this December. So what about maintenance therapy. What do we do after we've had a transplant? Or if, even if you don't have a transplant, should you stop treatment? Well, because this, that's a great question regarding if you don't have a transplant, but that's not the focus of this webcast this evening. So we're going to talk about patients who did have transplant. So why would we do this? Well, A, we would like them to stay in remission longer. B, we'd like them, if they didn't get a complete response, we already talked earlier that complete response is better than not having a complete response. Maybe we can get them to a complete response. And ultimately, we want people to live longer. So this is why we should consider maintenance therapy. The first trials were done with thalidomide. And there's a lot of numbers, a lot of stuff, uh, information in the slide. Let me just go down here. EFS is how long you stay in remission. So the likelihood of staying in remission for three years, if they didn't receive thalidomide, was 36%. And if you did, it was 52%. Similarly, Likelihood of being alive at four years, 77 versus 87 percent. Thalidomide improves the remission duration and improves survival, but it's a very toxic drug, and no one wants to take it. So what about Revlimid? There's three trials that are listed here. One was done in France, one was done in the U.S., and one was done in Italy. All show that when you look at Revlimid in one group after transplant versus no Revlimid, they all show that the group that had Revlimid had an 18 to 20 month longer remission duration. So Revlimid does improve the remission duration. One of those trials, the US trial, showed that the patients lived longer. The other two trials did not. Well, this slide summarizes a bunch of clinical data to come up with an answer, should you go on to maintenance or not. As shown here, all the trials, the four trials, showed an improvement in how long people stayed in remission, but the trials didn't convincingly show that you actually live longer. There is a risk of getting second cancers if you go on Revlimid maintenance. But so overall, improved remission. Some show an improvement survival, 
but there are certainly toxicities associated with any treatment duration. What about Velcade? This is fairly new information. There was a trial done in the Netherlands and Germany called the Hovon 65 where they gave Velcade before and after transplant and they showed an improvement in survival when they got Velcade before and after compared to either no Velcade or to thalidomide. This is a newer trial here that was just presented at our national meetings in June where they gave Velcade after transplant for four cycles and they found that the patients who had Velcade after the transplant, the remission duration was about six months longer. Now whether it's worth going on four months of Velcade to get a six month longer remission duration is uncertain, especially when you look at this five year OS means survival, there was no difference in the five year survival. So it did result in improvement in remission duration. Survival may take longer, but at this point in time, there was no improvement. What about the oral version of Velcade? It's called Exasimib. Shown here, there is not transplant data yet on Exasimib, but there is data on Exasimib in the non-transplant setting. I will tell you that it improved the depth of response. We had, they had more patients, almost half the patients had improvement in their response category. And it was safe. Toxicities were really quite manageable. So why not to use man why not use maintenance therapy for everybody? Well, as I already alluded to, two of the trials did not show any survival benefit. You could always get the drug later. It's expensive. Some of you have copays. There are toxicities. It causes low blood counts. There's a small risk of getting a second cancer. We don't have good tools yet talking about what impact it has on your quality of life. And we don't know what happens if you go on a maintenance drug and when you really need that drug to fight the disease, will it work? Because if you use a low level of Revlimid and you need to use higher doses of Revlimid, we don't know if it'll work later. We're going to end this talk and then I'll take questions on donor transplants. We already mentioned this. Good response rate, good effect of the graft, the, the donor's immune system, killing any myeloma that may be left, mortality rate 10 to 20%. Medicare does not pay for allotransplants. You have to have a donor, and it is still investigational. Most insurance companies will pay for it under a clinical trial. So a question was raised a few years back. Well, if you had a donor transplant, was that better than having a transplant using your own cells. So this was a very complicated trial. Patients had either two transplants using their own cells or they had a transplant using their own cells followed by a donor cell, donor transplant. Long story short, not to confuse you, there was no difference in outcomes in how long people stayed in remission. There was no difference in outcomes of their survival. So in this particular study, there was no benefit of doing a donor transplant compared to doing two autologous transplants. That being stated, that was a U.S. trial. There's a European trial, did almost the same exact thing, almost the same exact scenario, and they did find a benefit to doing a donor transplant. They looked at remission duration at five years was 33% for those who had a donor transplant to 18%. And even at eight years, 22% of the patients stayed in remission versus 12% if you had an autologous transplant. And survival, there's a typo here, was improved. It should be 49%, not 495. was better in patients at, six, at eight years if you had a donor transplant than if you did not have a donor transplant. So we have a large U.S. study that says no improvement. We have a European study that says yes, thus the reason why we consider to think of this as investigational. And... There is a current trial in the U.S. looking at patients that meet that high-risk definition of myeloma. They're going to have any previous therapy, but they have to be in remission. Then they get a donor transplant, and then they're either going to get this oral Velcade for maintenance or a placebo for maintenance. And hopefully we can fix these patients that have poor prognosis because they have bad side genetic features. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sue. And <coughs> thank you for your time and your listening to my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Wiesel, for an excellent presentation. I know there are a lot of questions, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, if you can go back to slide 57, that will probably get people Sorry. a nice resting place here. Um, so from Susan, I've just relapsed with multiple myeloma, lambda light chain, after three and a half years of remission. I do not believe I have a high-risk diagnosis, but it has not been particularly aggressive. I now have 4% cancer cells and wonder what my best step is. I had a stem cell transplant in the summer of 2012, and my doctors do not seem to be too concerned, but I am. So, unfortunately, as we already uh, mentioned a number of times, we don't cure the disease. It does eventually come back. We have a lot of treatments for it when it comes back. She had a transplant over three years ago. The, as we just saw in some of the other slides, the average remission duration, how long you stay in remission after transplant, is in about the two-and-a-half-year range. So she's actually done better than the average patient. When patients relapse, sometimes the first thing you see is a little blip in their protein, and we call that a biochemical relapse, meaning we know the disease is woken up, but it's not causing any of those symptoms. If you remember back, we talked about crab or crabby, just because you have a little blip of protein doesn't mean we have to intervene. So it sounds like this particular individual has relapsed, disease has shown up again, but she's not having any symptoms for it. The doctor doesn't want to do anything, and I agree. We don't need to do anything if it's not hurting her at this point in time. The key issue is, is how do you know when to start? Hopefully she's got a myeloma expert who will have a strong um, background in determining when's the best time to restart patients in therapy. But someone like this individual may go a year or more before she needs to have therapy reinstituted. The issue with reinstituting therapy is that the current dogma in the myeloma world is that once you start therapy, you never stop. So if she can have a longer period off of drugs, she should be happy because once we start the treatment, we essentially never stop again. All right, Lee has a question. He's wondering, when you have an M spike of less than 0 0.2, is it still considered as disease, or could that value come from something else and not disease? Yeah, it's, a, it's almost certainly uh, it's almost certainly residual, small amount of residual disease. That there is an exception to that statement. I, I, I don't mean to confuse the audience. But we already said that you're an IgG kappa, that's your eye color. Your eye colors don't change over the whole course of your life. Um, after transplant, when your immune system starts to kick back in again, because before it was suppressed and you didn't make normal antibodies, well, sometimes when the immune system starts to kick back in, it starts making a monoclonal antibody that's different than your myeloma antibody. And sometimes those low levels or actually your immune system kicking back in, and it's a different protein. So except for that, and that happens in 15 to 20 percent of patients after a transplant, that they'll transiently make a new protein, and then over time that'll go away. And it's not their myeloma protein, but it does show up on the serum protein electrophoresis as a 0.2 or a 0.3, and patients get upset. The doctors that aren't familiar with the disease go, oh, my gosh, the disease is back. But when you do that test to see what type of protein it is, that immunofixation, you find out it's not their IgG kappa, it's an IgA lambda, and it's not their myeloma. Susan asks, my husband has no crab symptoms, but has one slim crab criteria. One doctor says to wait and watch, and another doctor says to begin treatment now, followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. Which is better? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I skipped over this. It's actually in the slide set about the new criteria for when to treat patients. So we talked about before that 15% of myeloma patients have smoldering myeloma. That means they have no crab symptoms. Well, subsequent studies have shown that there is a subgroup of that smoldering myeloma population that is more likely to develop symptoms within two years. And that's defined as more than 60% plasma cells in their bone marrow, myeloma cells in their bone marrow, a free light chain ratio over 100, or an MRI or a PET or a regular CT scan showing one spot in your bones. So those patients don't have any symptoms, but the new slim 
myeloma criteria stands for the percentage of myeloma cells, the light chains, and the MRI, are now recommended to initiate treatment. So this individual is asymptomatic myeloma. It's not causing any symptoms, but he has one of those three criteria. And one doctor says yes, and one doctor says no. And it's a crapshoot, unfortunately. We don't want the patients to come in sick because we didn't act soon enough. We know there's an 80% chance that this individual will develop symptoms within two years. We would like to get him started on treatment before he develops those symptoms, thus the disagreement. Now, there are some patients I've been following who've met that criteria for four or five years. Well, I'm not going to start treating them now because they've been this high-risk group for all that time because 20% of them don't develop any symptoms. But if it's a newly diagnosed patient who meets that criteria, the consensus opinion in the myeloma field is that they should be treated before they develop end organ damage, which could compromise their life. Thank you. Sir, Sir Hari asks, for an autologous transplant, do the cells that are harvested from the patient prior to transplant and then get reinfused during transplant contain cancer cells? And if so, are there any methods for cleaning or purging them? So the answer to that question, unfortunately, is yes, they do contain small numbers of myeloma cells. Um, 15, at least 15, almost 20 years ago, we had explored a variety of different technologies to eradicate all myeloma cells from the stem cell graft. And we were able to do that to 99.99999% of the time that we could get rid of the myeloma cells. And what we found out was two things, what we learned from these different methodologies. A, when you treated the stem cells to that degree, it took a lot longer for the cells to grow and your immune systems were compromised because we got rid of some of the other cells you need for your, your immune system and your bone marrow to grow properly. And B, we found out they relapsed at the same rate as if we didn't purify the stem cells. So over 10 years ago, we gave up on purifying stem cells because it was not efficacious. The problem with myeloma is not getting rid of the cells from the the few number of cells that are in the transplant. The problem is that some of the myeloma cells sleep through one transplant, two transplants, 10 transplants. We can't kill all the myeloma cells in the bone marrow, and that's the reason why eventually they wake up and the disease recurs. Okay. Another person is asking, I only had enough stem cells for one collection during my first transplant. If I end up having another transplant next year, will I have more stem cells? It's been four years. So doing a second transplant in patients who have prolonged uh, remissions after the first transplant is a a reasonable um, endeavor. There's a couple issues. A, you uh, you have to have insurance approval. B, Medicare will only pay for one transplant, keeping in mind that the average age is 69 or 70. Medicare only pays for one transplant. And C, if you did use up all your stem cells, you have to get more stem cells. Um, About 80% of the time, when you go back, even after they had a previous transplant, and you try to recollect them at least 80% of the time, you are successful in collecting more cells. So this individual, even if they used up all their stem cells, it's it's more than 80% likely that they'd be able to collect enough cells to do another transplant, assuming she has insurance company, assume she has a Medicare. All right, we have a couple of people that ask, how long can stem cells be stored? Yeah, I mentioned that in my uh, presentation. They, they can be stored, as far as I can tell, forever. I've used stem cells that are over 12 years old in patients. They function just fine. The issue with storage is some transplant centers will only store them for five or 10 years, and they'll say, well, it's your responsibility to pay for it because it costs money to keep the cells in storage. But as far as the viability, once you follow them up, follow them and wake them up, they're good forever for all practical purposes. Okay. Uh, we have some questions about the term good partial remission. Uh, one person asked, I've had a stem cell transplant and obtained a very good partial remission. Would you please explain what that means? Is it a good prognosis? And would you address the benefits of a second transplant? Um, So the myeloma criteria for response is actually very confusing. 
and I don't mean to confuse people, maybe I should add that to my next slide set. Um, a partial remission means that the bad protein decreased by 50%. A very good partial remission means it decreased by 90%. A near complete remission means it's only detected on that immunofixation test. A complete remission means you can't detect it in the bone marrow, you can't detect it in the urine or the blood. But then there's actually a term called a stringent complete remission, which means you can't detect it anywhere, and your free light chain ratio is normal. And the latest definition is minimal residual disease, which means that you can't detect it using a laboratory test that can detect um, less than uh, less than one cell in 100,000. So there's all these different levels. So this particular individual had a, v, a very good partial remission, means that their protein decreased by 90%. The older studies about doing two transplants show that if you achieved a very good partial remission, you did not benefit from getting a second transplant. The trial I showed you with the U.S. trial, which were recapitulating what they did before is addressing that again, but I don't have the information. Based on the old data, the answer is no, they shouldn't have a second transplant. All right, Marshall's asking, is it better to get a transplant early or later after the disease returns? So the standard of care right now is to do a transplant early in that schema that I showed you, the French US trial where it's early versus late. The early transplant arm is the standard arm, the experimental arm in that trial is the patients who got the transplant late. So the current recommendation in the myeloma field, when I talk about myeloma field or myeloma experts, there's a group called the International Myeloma Working Group, of which there's 170 people worldwide. And we get together a couple times a year and come up with, or try to come up with agreements. It's hard to get 170 people to agree on anything, but we try to come up with agreements. But the agreement from the International Myeloma Working Group is that the early transplant is still the standard of care. That does not mean you can't wait. It does not mean it won't be effective late. We don't know the outcomes at this point in time pending that trial of early versus late. Okay, we have two questions on this same topic. My dad is 54 and was diagnosed with myeloma a month ago. Given his age, what's the chance of him living a long life? And in a similar vein, someone wrote, I read an article that stated that if you live five years after your transplant, you have an 80% chance of surviving to your natural life expectancy based on your genetics. Is this true? Now, let me answer the first one, then I want you to repeat the question on the second one. Okay. So the, the, uh, I, I showed some of this data. Again, this is all available to you, either listening to the webcast again or we can provide the slides to you. Based on current predictions, predictions, not counting new drugs that are coming available, and not counting drugs that have been available in the last two years, standard risk myeloma patients are predicted to have survivals of over 10 years. So dad at 54, and you can say 54 to 64 still isn't good, but that's not counting some of the drugs we already have that aren't included in that statistical analysis, nor the drugs coming available to us. So we think it's going to be 10 plus years. The problem we have with myeloma, and that's the majority of the patients, is the patients that have the higher risk disease based on their genetic makeup, that's the group of patients that we're really trying to improve the outcomes because they're not that good. And what was the second part of the question? Second question was, I read an article that stated that if you live five years after your transplant, you have an 80% chance of surviving to your natural life expectancy based off on your genetics. Is this true? Yeah, so that's all data generated from the University of Arkansas, from my former uh, colleague who I worked with for six years, Dr. Bart Barlegi. Um, his data shows that that may be true. It hasn't been confirmed by other studies is the bottom line. It's a fairly complex um, statistical analysis comparing outcomes in age match controls of non-myeloma patients with myeloma patients who stay in remission for a long period of time. And whether that's true or not really needs to be confirmed by other studies, but the Arkansas data does indicate what this individual um, has, has, has questioned, that their life expectancy would be similar to somebody who didn't have myeloma. Okay, 
Okay, Michelle wanted to know if you could comment on the long-term use of Aridia when there's been little bone disease. She wants to know if it's true that there's new evidence that long-term use of bisphosphonates can make the bones more brittle. So the answer to that is a little bit complex. Most people are actually getting uh, Zometa, Zoledronic Acid, not Aridia. They both work just as well. One's a 10 to 30 minute infusion, the other one's a two hour infusion. Um, older studies did not show that one was superior to the other. It's just that um, it's easier to administer the shorter uh, infusion rate. Um, the duration of how long you should be on bisphosphonates is very controversial. There is a trial that has yet to be published where they compared a large number of patients who'd received one year of monthly bisphosphonate, so made on this particular trial, and then they had a randomization that half the patients got it every three months, half the patients got it every month to see if there was a difference in how often you need to get the drug. The trial of myeloma is not available. They did a similar trial, though, in breast cancer, and they found there was no difference between every month versus three months. The current recommendations by the International Myeloma Working Group is that patients should get um, two years of bisphosphonates. If they're in remission, they can discontinue. Um, patients who have a transplant and go into complete remission probably can fit, stop after one year. So there's a, there's a couple different sources to answer that question. The issues she's talking about are microfractures from bisphosphonates, and, and that's true. The, one of the, there are a number of different side effects from long-term bisphosphonate use. The most common one, which I'm surprised you didn't ask me, is about this fairly rare uh, entity called osteonecrosis of the jaw, which can be very disabling, which uh, the bones of the mandible more than the maxilla can actually die. No one knows how this hap why it happens. It's fairly rare, but it is related to bisphosphonate use. But you can see these microfractures in the pelvis of some patients who've been on long-term bisphosphonates. These are not life-threatening. They're uncomfortable. They're not very common. But for the most part, most of us decrease, especially if you don't have active disease, we cut back on how often you get the bisphosphonates to prevent some of these specific long-term side effects. All right. Pamela had a question. She asked, I had a stem cell transplant 11 years ago, and I relapsed in September of 2014. I received Velcade and Revlimid, but have had problems with elevated liver enzymes. Recently, I had gallbladder surgery to see if this will help the liver metabolize the chemo. Are there other medications that could be used that would not be as likely to affect the liver? Yeah, the, both, both those drugs rarely can affect the liver, um, and I do mean rarely. Uh, perhaps, you know, they should try one or the other and see if, uh, if it still causes a liver problem. Um, just give the Velcade or just give the Revlimid, and if that's still a problem, switch to the other one. Um, somebody like that who's 11 years out, I would be very, very interested in doing another transplant and not having to deal with the Velcade and the Revlimid. I have no idea what kind of insurance she has, what kind of uh, shape she's in at this point in time, but if she got 11 years out of her first transplant, I would think that she'd get four to five years out of another one. All right, Natalie asked, have stem cells harvested from umbilical cord blood been used in transplant for myeloma patients? If so, what's been the success rate, and should I consider saving my uh, child's cord blood for my grandfather? Yeah, so there are almost no publications on cord bloods in myeloma. Um, and it's just not very frequently used. Um, they There are other sources of stem cells, and number of cord bloods is really very, very small. There's probably no reason to save, There's too, it's too many generations for her to save that cord for somebody in her family. And not only that, if it's her grandfather and he's over 65, he can't use the cord anyway because it's a donor transplant. So I, I would not recommend people save cords for other family members. It's probably better to get an unrelated person, or now we're doing what we call haplotransplants, which are half transplants, um, ha you know, half matched donors, which would be a kid, a child, or a parent, if the parent's still alive and in good health, um, probably as good as doing using that as doing an unrelated person. Cord bloods are the most difficult type of transplants because the immune system is most compromised with that technology. 
All right. Adina asks, when doing an auto stem cell transplant for a patient with renal problems, does lowering the melphalan dose affect the efficacy of killing off the myeloma cells? And how does the regular dose potentially hurt the kidneys? So the melphalan does not affect the kidneys. Um, because of side effects, we generally do decrease the dose only for patients on dialysis. It can be safely administered. It's a little more um, challenging to do transplants in patients on dialysis, but they can be safely done. The toxicities are higher, particularly in the in the GI system, the mouth, the intestines, uh, bowel is higher in patients that have renal insufficiency, even though the drug is not um, cleared any much differently than if you have normal kidneys. So in general, you use a lower dose, and yes, a lower dose is associated with slightly less efficacy. So the remission durations in patients on, that are on dialysis with a decreased dose of melphalan is a somewhat shorter than those who get full dose. Thomas would like to know if there are any special considerations for transplant if a patient is diabetic. No, there are no special considerations. Um, the issue with diabetes is actually less of a problem with the transplant. It's more of a problem with conventional therapies because all of them contain dexamethasone, the steroids, which, give, which probably throws their problems with their sugars or hyperglycemia way out of control. We don't really give much in the way of steroids except for a pre-medication before the chemotherapy because it helps with nausea. Otherwise, they're not getting a whole lot of steroids. So diabetes is really not a contraindication to having a transplant. Okay, we have two last questions here. Andrea wants to know, can you get graft versus host disease after an autologous stem cell transplant? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is you can get the same some of the same manifestations. We don't know why this happens. You can get some of the manifestations of graft versus host disease, can be, or diarrhea, skin rash, uh, lung infiltrates, fevers. You can see this. We we have we we call it we don't call it graft versus host disease. We give it a different name called engraftment syndrome, um, and this does occur in uh, up to 15 percent of patients who go through autologous transplant, and you actually have to put them on steroids to suppress that reaction. It's something, you know, we talked before about Sprint and AT&T. This is sort of like uh, um, a different network that stimulates the body's immune system to go haywire, and you have to suppress that with steroids, and you can control it in almost all patients. And we'll end with a question from Michael who said, I had an auto transplant in 2013, but relapsed after about eight months. I also had an allogeneic transplant in 2014, and I'm on Revlimid, uh, Velcade, and dexamethadone maintenance. Should I expect a longer response with the allo transplant? Hopefully. Um, well, first of all, you have two things that are different than after the autologous transplant. The first thing you have is you have the donor's immune system hopefully keeping the myeloma at bay for a longer period of time. And the second thing you have is they put them on consolidation therapy after his allogeneic transplant. So between those two things, hopefully we can keep uh, Michael going for a long period of time. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wiesel, for your excellent presentation. I know I certainly learned a lot from it, and I'm sure everyone listening did as well. I'd also like to thank again our partners, Sanofi, Celgene, and Takeda Oncology, whose sponsorship enabled us to present this night's webinar. And if you want to learn more about stem cell transplants for multiple myeloma, I encourage you to visit us online at www.bmtinfonet.org or phone us toll-free at 888-597-7674. For those of you who would be interested in having a set of the slides that Dr. Wiesel presented, you can call us at that toll-free number, or you can also email us at help, H-E-L-P, at bmtinfonet.org. Thank you, everyone, and good night.